Thank you for joining today's Nile webinar. This is Lisa, the Education Manager for Immunize Nevada, and I will be today's moderator. Before we get started, I'd like to review a couple of housekeeping items. Please first locate the chat box in the bottom left corner of your screen. If you have any questions, type them into the chat box and we'll address those questions at the end of the presentation. Secondly, if you have requested nursing or pharmacy continuing education credits for today's webinar, please make sure you complete the survey in the post-webinar email. The email will be sent out by the end of today and all CEUs will be emailed out within the next week. A little disclaimer, Immunize Nevada's NIA webinars are made possible by the generosity of speakers who donate their time and expertise to benefit the coalition. The expectation and goal is for community partners to gain knowledge on immunization-related topics through a non-branded, unbiased presentation. I'd like to now turn it over to our speaker, Commander Tina Obgio, <clears throat> who is a nurse educator with a communication and education branch at CDC and a U.S. Public Health Service officer. She began her nursing career as a U.S. Air Force nurse in Las Vegas, Nevada, and has worked on the both and state federal level uh, during her career. She has been with the CDC for five years, and in 2017, um, she became, joined the Communication and Education Branch of the Immunization Services Division. She has been a registered nurse since 2005. Thank you for joining us today, Tina, and I'll let you take it away from here. Thank you for the introduction. I have a lot of information to share on the topic of pneumococcal vaccines for adults, so let's dive right in. Here are the usual disclosures. I am a federal employee with no financial interest in or conflict with the manufacturer of any product named in this presentation. I will discuss the off-label use of vaccines. I will not discuss any vaccine not currently licensed by the FDA. I will be covering a little bit of history on pneumococcal disease and vaccine development. I will discuss some epidemiology and data that relates to the application of risk factors for pneumococcal disease. The level of risk then determines the pneumococcal vaccines recommended as well as intervals. All of this can be rather complex, so I'll also share some tools that can be used to help staff implement recommendations made by Advisory Committee on Immunization Practices, or ACIP. Last, I will present some simple case studies to help you gauge your level of understanding. If you are a beginner with pneumococcal vaccines or just struggling to understand recommendations, don't worry, you don't have to get all of this on one take. I'll share some additional training resources at the very end of the presentation. Streptococcus pneumoniae causes an acute bacterial infection. The bacterium, also called pneumococcus, was first isolated by Pasteur in 1881 from the saliva of a patient with rabies. The association between the pneumococcus and lobar pneumonia was first described in 1883, but pneumococcal pneumonia was confused with other types of pneumonia until the development of the Gram stain in 1884. From 1915 to 1945, the chemical structure and antigenicity of the pneumococcal, cap pneumococcal capsular polysaccharide, its association with virulence, and the role of bacterial polysaccharides in human disease were explained. More than 80 serotypes of pneumococci had been described by 1940. Efforts to develop effective pneumococcal vaccines began as early as 1911. However, with the advent of penicillin in the 1940s, interest in pneumococcal vaccination declined until it was observed that many patients still died despite antibiotic treatment. By the late 1960s, efforts were again being made to develop a polyvalent pneumococcal vaccine. The first pneumococcal vaccine was licensed in the United States in 1977. The first conjugate pneumococcal vaccine was licensed in 2000. Streptococcus pneumoniae bacteria are lancet-shaped, gram-positive, facultative anaerobic organisms. They are usually observed in pairs, but may also occur singularly or in short chains. Some pneumococci are encapsulated, their surfaces composed of complex polysaccharides. Encapsulated organisms cause disease for humans and are the primary basis for the pathogenicity of the organism. The polysaccharide capsules are antigenic and form the basis for classifying pneumococci by serotypes. 92 serotypes have been identified 
based on their reaction with type-specific antisera. Type-specific antibody to capsular polysaccharide is protective. These antibodies and complement interact to opsonize pneumococci, which facilitates phagocytosis and clearance of the organism of the same serotype. Antibodies to some pneumococcal capsular polysaccharides may cross-react with related types as well as with other bacteria, providing protection against additional serotypes. Most Streptococcus pneumoniae serotypes have been shown to cause serious disease, but only a few serotypes produce the majority of pneumococcal infections. The 10 most common serotypes are estimated to account for about 62% of invasive disease worldwide. The ranking and serotype prevalence differ by patient age group and geographic area. In the United States, prior to the widespread use of PCV7, the seven most common serotypes isolated from blood or cerebral fluid, cerebral spinal fluid, CSF, of children younger than six years of age account for 80% of infections. These seven serotypes account for about 50% of isolates from older children and adults. Pneumococcal disease is the second most common cause of vaccine-preventable death in the U.S., and as many of you might guess, the first is influenza. Pneumococcal pneumonia is the most common form of pneumococcal disease in adults. Pneumococcal pneumonia alone is not considered to be invasive disease. It is estimated that about 900,000 Americans get pneumococcal pneumonia each year, and about 5 to 7 percent die from it. As many as 400,000 hospitalizations from pneumococcal pneumonia are estimated to occur annually in the U.S. The incubation period of pneumococcal pneumonia is short, about one to three days. Symptoms generally include an, an abrupt onset of fever and chills or rigors. Typically, there's a single rigor and repeated shaking chills are uncommon. Other common symptoms include pleuritic chest pain, cough, productive of mucopurulent rusty sputum, dyspnea, or shortness of breath, tachypnea, or rapid breathing, hypoxia, or poor oxygenation, tachycardia, or rapid heart rate, malaise, and weakness. Nausea, vomiting, and headaches occur less frequently. Other clinical syndromes include the two most common forms of invasive disease, bacteremia and meningitis. Bacteremia is bloodstream infection, and meningitis is infection of the meninges, the lining covering the brain and spinal cord. Symptoms may include headache, lethargy, vomiting, irritability, fever, nuchal rigidity, cranial nerve signs, seizures, and coma. An estimated 5,000 cases of pneumococcal bacteremia without pneumonia occur each year. The overall case fatality rate for bacteremia is about 20%, but it may be as high as 60% among elderly patients. Pneumococci cause over 50% of all cases of bacterial meningitis in the United States. An estimated 2,000 cases of pneumococcal meningitis occur each year. This graph of invasive pneumococcal disease shows the rate of invasive disease per 100,000 population by age group and demonstrates that the highest rates of invasive disease occur in those younger than two years of age and those 65 years of age or older. These data are generated by CDC's Active Bacterial Core Surveillance System, or ABC's data, and highlight age as an important risk factor for invasive disease. In addition to age-related risk factors, there are also medical risk factors for invasive disease. These include functional or anatomic asplenia, and functional asplenia includes sickle cell disease because sickle cell disease slowly destroys the affected person's spleen. Altered immunocompetence is a risk factor for invasive disease. Also, other underlying medical conditions like chronic renal disease, nephrotic syndrome, and conditions that predispose to cerebral spinal fluid or CSF leak. Also, patients with cochlear implants have an increased risk of pneumococcal meningitis. 
Other underlying medical conditions are risk factors for invasive disease, but the risk is lower. These include chronic heart disease, chronic lung disease, diabetes, alcoholism, chronic liver disease, and solid organ transplant. There are behavioral risk factors that predispose to invasive disease, primarily due to the effect on the immune system. This has been observed in cigarette smokers 19 years of age and older, so smoking is also a risk factor. This graph shows the incidence of invasive pneumococcal disease in adults ages 18 through 64 years who are healthy compared to those with selected underlying conditions. Cases of IPD per 100,000 persons are shown on the vertical axis and, condi and conditions are listed on the horizontal axis. The two columns on the right of the graph demonstrate that individuals with hematological cancer and HIV AIDS have a more than 20-fold increased rate of IPD compared to persons without these conditions. Adults with the other conditions on the graph have a three to seven-fold increased risk for IPD compared to persons without these conditions. As you can see, the risk can be broken down into two categories and for the sake of making this easy to understand, you will hear me call these groups high risk and highest risk when we discuss vaccine indications later on. There's also a group between these two that I will refer to as higher risk, but that group is not shown on this slide. They will be discussed later and include persons with CSF leak or cochlear implant. The reservoirs for pneumococcal disease are human carriers. Pneumococci are common inhabitants of the respiratory tract and may be isolated from the nasopharynx of 5 to 90% of healthy adults. Rates of asymptomatic carriage vary with age, environment, and the presence of upper respiratory infections. Only 5 to 10% of adults without children are carriers. On military installations, as many as 50 to 60% of service personnel may be carriers. The duration of carriage varies and is generally longer in children than adults. In addition, the relationship of carriage to the development of natural immunity is poorly understood. Transmission of F pneumoniae occurs as a result of direct person-to-person -person contact via respiratory droplets and by auto-inoculation in persons carrying the bacteria in their upper respiratory tract. Pneumococcal infections are more common during the winter and in early spring when respiratory diseases are more prevalent. The period of communicability for pneumococcal disease is unknown, but presumably transmission can occur as long as the organism appears in respiratory secretions. I'm now going to talk about pneumococcal vaccines. These vaccines are composed of pneumococcal polysaccharide. The first vaccines licensed were considered pure polysaccharide vaccines. The first contained polysaccharide from 14 different types of pneumococcus and was licensed in 1977. In 1983, a 23 valent polysaccharide vaccine was licensed and replaced the 14 valent form. In 2000, the first pneumococcal conjugate vaccine was licensed consisting of polysaccharide from seven types of pneumococcus conjugated to a non-toxic diphtheria cross-reactive material, or CRM, carrier protein. In 2010, an expanded 13-valent conjugate vaccine replaced the seven serotype conjugate vaccine. PCV7 was introduced into the routine schedule in 2000 and has been tremendously successful in reducing the rate of invasive pneumococcal disease, or IPD. Between 1998 and 2009, PCV7 reduced rates of PCV7 type invasive disease, along with serotype 6A, by 99%, and reduced rates of invasive disease caused by all serotypes by 76%. Although this slide is about declining rates of IPD in children after PCV7 was introduced, it is relevant to adult IPD rates. The next few slides show the indirect effects observed in the adult population after PCV7 was added to the childhood routine schedule.
This figure shows changes in the incidence of invasive pneumococcal disease among adults 19 through 64 years of age from 1998 through 2015 in the United States. Rates of IPD expressed as cases per 100,000 population are shown on the y-axis and calendar year of surveillance on the x-axis. Blue bars represent overall IPD incidence Orange bars represent IPD incidents caused by serotypes included in 23-valent pneumococcal polysaccharide vaccine, PPSV23, while the gray bars represent IPD incidents caused by serotypes included in the 13-valent pneumococcal conjugate vaccine. Note the decline starting in 2000, as mentioned in the previous slide, and I put a green arrow there to make that a little bit easier for you to see. The overall IPD incidence declined from 16 cases per 100,000 in 1998 to 7 cases per 100,000 in 2015. IPD caused by PCV13 serotypes declined from 11 cases per 100,000 in 1998 to 2 cases per 100,000 in 2015. IPD caused by PPSV23 serotypes also declined from 14 cases per 100,000 in 1998 to 5 cases per 100,000 in 2015. But these reductions were due to declines in IPD caused by serotypes in common with PCV13. This figure shows changes in the incidence of invasive pneumococcal disease among adults 65 years or older from 1998 through 2015 in the United States. The overall IPD incidence declined from 59 cases per 100,000 in 1998 to 23 cases per 100,000 in 2015. IPD caused by PCV13 serotypes declined from 44 cases per 100,000 in 1998 to 5 cases per 100,000 in 2015. IPD caused by PPSV23 serotypes also declined from 51 cases per 100,000 in 1998 to 13 cases per 100,000 in 2015. But these reductions were, as in younger adults, due to declines in IPD caused by serotypes in common with PCV13. In 2013, 20 to 25% of invasive pneumococcal disease cases among adults 65 years old and older were attributable to PCV13 serotypes. PCV13 serotypes accounted for 10% of community-acquired pneumonia cases in adults, and this includes pneumonias with no bacteremia. The pneumococcal polysaccharide vaccine, or PPSV23, contains polysaccharide antigen from 23 types. These types cause 60 to 76 percent of invasive disease generally. However, this vaccine is not effective in children, children younger than two years of age because it does not generate lasting immune memory. It also has not been demonstrated to provide protection against pneumococcal pneumonia, for this reason, providers should avoid referring to PPSV23 as pneumonia vaccine. The pneumococcal conjugate vaccine, or PCV13, contains 13 serotypes, seven of which were also in PCV7, 4, 6B, 9V, 14, 18C, 19F, and 23F, as well as six additional serotypes, 1, 3, 5, 6A, 7F, and 19A conjugated to the same non-toxic diphtheria cross-reactive material 197 carrier protein as PCV7. It contains one serotype, type 6A, that is not in PPSV23. More importantly, because it is a conjugate vaccine, it generates a long-lasting immune response that is useful in children as well as adults. It was approved by FDA based on demonstration of immunologic non-inferiority to PCV7 rather than clinical efficacy. Having discussed burden of disease, I will move on to immunogenicity and effectiveness, beginning with PPSV23 vaccine. 
While 80% of healthy adults who receive PBSC23 vaccine develop antibodies against the serotypes contained in the vaccine, most estimates of effectiveness range between 60 to 70% against invasive disease among immunocompetent older persons and adults with underlying illnesses. Effectiveness among immunocompromised or very old persons is not demonstrated. The confidence intervals become very wide in most studies looking at adults 40 years old or older, and some effectiveness estimates are, are as low as 10%. As mentioned, the vaccine is not thought to prevent pneumococcal pneumonia. A note on the complexity of recommendations for PCV13. PCV13 is approved by the Food and Drug Administration for children 6 weeks through 17 years of age and for adults 50 years of age and older initially and since August 2016 for all adults 18 years and older. ACIP's recommendations and CDC's guidance recommended this vaccine for broader use earlier. Beyond the routine infant-toddler recommendation, which we will not discuss today, ACIP recommended use of PCV13 for immunocompromised persons six years of age and older in 2012 and 2013, and ACIP recommend, recommended use of PCV13 for all adults 65 years and older in 2014. PCV13 was licensed for use among adults 50 years old or older on December 30, 2011. FDA approved this use under the accelerated approval pathway, and it was based on serologic studies that compared the response of PCV13 recipients to a response of PPSV23 recipients. One of the post-approval conditions of licensure was the performance of a randomized controlled trial of PCV13 against pneumococcal pneumonia among adults 65 years old and older in the Netherlands, the CAPITA trial. A randomized placebo-controlled trial, the CAPITA trial, was conducted in the Netherlands among approximately 85,000 adults 65 years old or older between 2008 and 2013 to evaluate the clinical benefit of PCV13 in the prevention of pneumococcal pneumonia. PCV13 demonstrated 75% efficacy against vaccine-type invasive pneumococcal disease and 45% efficacy against PCV13 serotype non-bacteremic pneumonia. Because of these results, ACIP now also recommends a dose of PCV13 in all adults 65 years of age or older if they have not already received a dose of PCV13. Now that I've discussed vaccine recommendations for PCV13 and PPSV23, I'd like to discuss how to use the two vaccines together. These recommendations are based on CDC guidance, not FDA licensure. First, PCV13 and PPSV23 should not be administered during the same clinic visit. Either vaccine may be administered simultaneously with influenza vaccine and most other routinely recommended vaccines, but do not give PCV13 and PPSV23 together and administer PCV13 before PPSV23 if they're both indicated. PCV13 eligible adults receive one dose if they have never had this vaccine before. This is true even after they turn 65. No additional doses of PCV13 are indicated if they have ever had a dose before. For PPSV23, eligible adults may receive up to two doses before 65 and a third dose after 65. Eligibility is based on risk factors. PPSV23 doses should be separated by at least five years. There are a few additional rules on timing if both PCV13 and PPSV23 are indicated based on risk when PCV13 is administered first. Wait eight weeks before administering PPSV23. If PPSV23 is administered before PCV13, wait one year before administering PCV13. 
Studies have shown that the immune response is better if PCD13 is given first, but if PPSV23 is given first, waiting a year before giving PCD13 is recommended. Last, if any of these timing intervals were violated, there's no need to try to calculate any further for adults. The doses count and do not need to be repeated. This can get really confusing, so this slide shows a few of the job aids that are available to help you. Some states have very good job aids that they have developed as well. On the next slide, we're going to look at another page of the third job aid that's shown here. Here is a page from the third job aid shown on the last slide, also available on our website shown at the bottom of the slide. <clears throat> I'm not sure how well you'll be able to see this, so I'm going to highlight a few features. Across the top, you will note the different age ranges, 19 to 64 years or 65 years and older, along with the two pneumococcal vaccine types, PCV13 and PPSV23. To the far left of the table, I added a column to emphasize risk categories using green, yellow, orange, and red. Along the left of the pink and blue table, you will see medical indications and conditions. This job aid allows the user to select the age and condition to find the corresponding recommendation to use PCV13, PPSV23, or both. It's a nice table to reference because it captures risk factors, age, and vaccine type, which are key factors for pneumococcal vaccine use. I would note that pneumococcal vaccines can be confusing even for seasoned healthcare professionals, so keeping job aids near your vaccine supply can really help your staff. There are additional pages on this website that highlight schedules and intervals, but they're difficult to read in a PowerPoint presentation, so I'm going to go through a few scenarios using slightly different graphics. PCV13 and PPSV23 adult vaccination recommendations are divided between two age groups, persons who are 19 through 64 years of age or 65 years of age and older. Immunization recommendations for, pa for persons 19 through 64 years of age are based on risk, including those at high risk, with chronic medical conditions but who are not immunocompromised or at more than moderate risk of pneumococcal infection. Higher risk, specifically those with cochlear implants and cerebral spinal fluid leaks. And highest risk, which includes persons who are immunocompromised for one or more reasons. Persons at high risk include those with pulmonary disease, including COPD, emphysema, and asthma, cardiac disease, such as congestive heart failure and cardiomyopathies, but excluding hypertension, liver disease, including cirrhosis, diabetes, alcoholism, smokers, residents of a long-term care facility. These persons are recommended to receive one dose of PPSV23 before 65 years of age. PCV13 is not indicated for this group before age 65. The higher risk persons, those with cochlear implants and cerebral spinal fluid leaks, should receive a dose of PCV13 first, followed by PPSV23 in eight weeks. No revaccination is recommended for these persons until they reach 65 years. If these persons have already received PPSV23 as adults, they should receive PCV13 at least one year after the PPSV23 dose. Highest risk for IPD include adults 19 through 64 years of age with immunosuppression, including HIV infection, generalized or hematologic malignancy, organ transplant, functional or anatomic asplenia, including sickle cell disease, chronic renal failure, or nephrotic syndrome. Individuals in the highest risk category should receive PCV13 once, followed by PPSV23 in eight weeks, 
and be revaccinated with PPSV23 five years after the first PPSV23 dose before age 65. Persons 65 years and older who have not received PCV13 should receive one dose followed by PPSV23 in one year. If they have not received a dose of PPSV23 at 65 years or older and they have an increased risk for IPD, higher or highest risk categories, the interval between PCV13 and PPSV23 should be eight weeks as described earlier. If the patient has received PPSV23 already at 65 or older, one dose of PCV13 should be given one year after the PPSV23 dose. If the patient has received PPSV23 before 65 years, PCV13 should still be given at 65 or older, provided at least one year has passed since the PPSV23 dose. A final dose of PPSV23 should follow in eight weeks if they have an increased risk or one year if not at increased risk. Let's review contraindications and precautions for pneumococcal vaccines, and thankfully these are straightforward. The only contraindication to both of these vaccines is a severe allergic reaction to a vaccine component or following a prior dose of vaccine, and the only precaution is a moderate or severe acute illness. PCV13 and PPSV23 can both be administered by intramuscular injection. The deltoid is the preferred site, but the vastus lateralis may also be used. PPSV23 may also be administered by subcutaneous injection, and the upper outer triceps area is preferred. A common administration error among adult patients is giving more than one revaccination dose of PPSV23 in the 19 to 64 age range. As previously discussed, only two doses of PPSV23 are recommended for certain at-risk groups before the 65th birthday. PPSV23 and PCV13 are both inactivated vaccines, which means you can give them with all other recommended vaccines during the same visit using separate syringes or at any later time with no waiting period. The exception, in addition to the rule that PCV13 and PPSV23 should not be administered during the same visit, is as follows. If the person has functional or anatomic asplenia, if using Menactra, men ACWI vaccine, give PCV13 first, with a four-week separation between the final dose of PCV13 and Menactra. For Menveo, there are no intervals that need to be observed. They can be given the same visit or before or after each other at different visits. Known adverse reactions do occur with these vaccines. Local reactions occur with 30 to 50% of doses of PPSV23. The rate of fever and myalgia is less than 1% and severe adverse reactions are rare. For PCV, local reactions are similar to PPSV23, but the rate of fever is higher and febrile seizures, while rare, occurring in only 1 to 14 out of 100,000 doses, have a slightly higher rate when other vaccines are administered at the same time, particularly influenza vaccine. If both vaccines are administered simultaneously, the rate of febrile seizures rises to 4 to 45 out of 100,000 doses. Severe adverse local reactions occur in 8% of vaccine, and this grading of severe includes tenderness that affects limb movement. Pneumococcal vaccines should be stored in the refrigerator between 36 to 46 degrees Fahrenheit or 2 to 8 degrees Celsius. We frequently hear about vaccine administration errors related to the wrong formulation being administered. PPSV23 being administered when PCV13 was indicated and vice versa. Strategies which may help prevent these errors include 
storing the vaccine formulation separately in the original packaging. When both formulations are mixed together in the same bin or area, it's easy for staff to grab and administer the wrong formulation. And label bins clearly. The Prevnar 13 and Pneumovax 23 labels are shown on the right and are available on the website listed at the bottom of the slide. These can be printed. Now let's take some time to look at a few different scenarios to apply some of the concepts we just reviewed. I'm going to read a simple case study and then I'll pause for a few moments for you to consider the answer and then we'll review the answer together. Rita just turned 65 years old. Today she is being seen by her primary health care provider. Rita was diagnosed with diabetes when she was 63 years old and received PPSV23 at the time of her diagnosis. She has never received PCV13. Should she receive any pneumococcal vaccines today? If so, which ones? And the correct answer is B. Rita should receive PCV13 today. It has been more than one year since her PPSV23 dose, so she can get PCV13 vaccine today. Rita should not receive PPSV23 today. PPSV23 should be administered again after her 65th birthday, but the interval between PPSV23 doses is five years, so Rita would be eligible for a dose five years after the last dose when she's 68 years old. Margaret is a 70-year-old patient with immunosuppression due to cancer treatment that began two months ago. Her immunization history includes PCV13 and PPSV23, both administered after 65 years of age, but before the onset of her immunosuppressing condition. Should PPSV23 be administered today? And the answer to this one is no. Even though this patient now has an immunosuppressing condition, only one dose of PPSV23 is recommended after the age of 65 years. Enrique is a 54-year-old man who lost his spleen as a result of an automobile accident when he was 50 years old. He's otherwise healthy and prior to his accident had never had any pneumococcal vaccines. What pneumococcal vaccines should he have received after losing his spleen, if any? And the answer is D, both PCV13 and PPSV23. Because asplenic patients are in the highest risk category, PCV13 should be administered first, followed by PPSV23 eight weeks later. Enrique is now 55 years old and is being seen for a routine visit. It has been at least five years since his first pneumococcal vaccines, given at 50 years following loss of his spleen. What vaccines should he receive now, if any? And the correct answer is PPSV23. If it has been at least five years since his last dose of PPSV23, he's due for an additional dose. Individuals in the highest risk categories receive two doses of PPSV23 before the age of 65 years old. A second dose of PCV13 is not recommended for adults. Should Enrique ever receive additional doses of pneumococcal vaccines? And the options here are no, he should not receive additional doses. Yes, he should receive PPSV23 and PCV13 when he turns 65. Yes, he should receive only PPSV23 when he turns 65. Or yes, he should receive only PCV13 when he turns 65. And the correct answer here is C. 
He should receive PPSV23 when he turns 65. Adults should receive a dose of PPSV23 at 65 years of age as long as it has been at least five years since a previous dose. Only one dose of PCV13 is recommended for adults, and Enrique had a dose of PCV13 when he was 50 years old. Mari is a 20-year-old college student who just received a cochlear implant. She received PCV7 in childhood and has no other pneumococcal vaccination history. Should her healthcare provider recommend and administer any pneumococcal vaccines, and if so, which ones? And the answer is D. Mari's now in the higher risk category. Mari's never received PCV13, so that vaccine would be given first, and then PPSV23 would be administered at least eight weeks later. And just a, a note on that, you know, actually um, for people who have um, a planned procedure that would qualify them for pneumococcal vaccines, actually the recommendation is try to, to, to try to administer what would be recommended once their procedure or um, therapy is started. So in, in this case, the best scenario would have been to complete her vaccines before her cochlear implant, but that didn't happen for Mari, so she got them after. Okay, so Mari receives PCV13 and PPSV23 vaccine per her healthcare provider's recommendation. What should the provider tell Mari about the need for any future doses of pneumococcal vaccines? So options are the next dose of PPSV23 is due in five years. The next dose of PCV13 is due in five years. No further pneumococcal vaccines would be indicated at any future time. Or a dose of PPSV23 would be recommended on or after Mari turns 65 years of age. And the correct answer is D. If Mari doesn't develop any immunocompromising conditions resulting in the need for additional pneumococcal vaccines, she would be due for a dose of PPSV23 at 65 years of age under current ACIP recommendations. Mari is now 30 years old and has been diagnosed with Hodgkin disease. What, if any, additional pneumococcal vaccines should she receive at this time? And the correct answer is C, PPSV23. Mari is now in the highest risk category with an immunocompromising condition, and since it has been more than five years since her last dose of PPSV23, she would receive a second dose of PPSV23 now. Additional doses of PCV13 are not recommended. Of note, a third dose of PPSV23 would be recommended on or after Mari's 65th birthday. So a few additional points regarding treatment planning, and I discussed this briefly, but I'm going to go into it into greater detail. When elective splenectomy, immunocompromising therapy, or cochlear implant placement is being planned, providers should choose the vaccines appropriate to the level of risk for invasive pneumococcal disease which would exist after the surgery or treatment. For example, a person who will undergo elective splenectomy should be considered asplenic when applying these vaccine recommendations. The choice of vaccine also depends on past history of pneumococcal vaccination. After assessing the past history, if PCV13 and PPSV23 are both recommended, they both need to be administered, preferably before treatment or surgery, but they cannot be administered at the same time. Prevnar 13 should be administered first. The interval to the dose app the dose of Pneumovax 23 should be at least eight weeks, determined by the risk of invasive pneumococcal disease, which would exist after the treatment or surgery, as well as the past history of pneumococcal vaccination. If treatment or surgery cannot be delayed for more than eight weeks or longer, providers can consider administering Pneumovax 23 after the treatment or surgery. And that information can be found in the Pink Book Supplement, which I believe is Chapter 17. So let's discuss timing and interval errors. Prevnar 13 and Pneumovax 23 should not be administered simultaneously or at an interval less than eight weeks. 
However, in adults, if Prevnar 13 and Pneumovax 23 are administered simultaneously or at an interval less than eight weeks, neither dose needs to be repeated. A note, the rules are different for children, so you need to see the pink book supplement. High-risk patients, patients with functional or anatomic asplenia, altered immunocompetence, or renal disease, are recommended to receive two doses of Pneumovax 23 separated by a five-year interval unless the first dose was administered after the 65th birthday, in which case no additional doses are recommended. The interval between these two doses is five years. If this five-year interval is violated, both doses should be considered valid, and neither dose needs to be repeated. So basically everything I just said there was that if you make a mistake um, in the spacing or interval for adults, the doses count, which is not usual, the usual case for most other vaccines. Um, hematopoietic cell transplant or HCT therapy. HCT recipients are at increased risk for certain vaccine preventable diseases. As a result, HCT recipients should be routinely revaccinated after HCT regardless of the source of the transplant cells. Revaccination with inactivated vaccines should begin six months after HCT, and three doses of PCV13 should be given six months after HCT followed by a dose of PPSV23. And that information can be found in the Pink Book General Rex chapter. Um, it's always good to check for updates on all vaccines, including pneumococcal vaccines. New recommendations from Advisory Committee on Immunization Practices are published in Morbidity and Mortality Weekly Reports, or MMWRs, after the ACIP votes and CDC Director approves the recommendation. Current vaccine recs can be found by vaccine type at the site shown on the bottom of the slide. The Pink Book is another excellent resource for providers, and that site is also provided at the bottom of this slide. Off-label recommendations, <clears throat> ACIP does advise that PPSV23 can be administered with Zostavax, while the package insert for Pneumovax 23 says to consider administration of the two vaccines separated by at least four weeks due to a reduced immune response to Zostavax. If you would like additional review on pneumococcal vaccines with free CEs, I have provided some links to training resources here. The first link shown is a website with vaccine training information. You can access many different training resources from the site for a variety of vaccines. Two trainings specific to pneumococcal vaccines can be found at the second and third links shown. One is a self-paced training called You Call the Shots, and the second is a pink book webinar recording with slides. These can be accessed and completed online and provide continuing education credits. If you can't find the answer to one of your questions using resources shared today, we can be contacted for vaccine-specific questions at nipinfo at cdc.gov. We can usually respond to your question within one business day. That concludes the presentation, and I think we have time for a few questions now, if there are any. Well, thank you so much, Tina. That's such a wonderful presentation. And before we say goodbye, I, we'd like to offer a little bit more time for last-minute questions. So please type those questions into the chat box now. While we are waiting for those questions to be typed in, just a couple of reminders. If you have requested nursing or pharmacy and continuing education credits for today's webinar, please make sure you complete the survey in the post-webinar email. The email will be sent out by the end of today and all CEUs will be emailed out within the next week. If you would like to view or share this webinar, the recording will be available on our website along with information for future webinars. Please visit immunizednevada.org backslash webinars for those details. And I will give everyone just a couple more minutes. <clears throat> Also, too, Tina, your questions today might be a little technical, too. If anyone has any questions that can't type it into the uh, chat box before you hang up, I can connect you, or you can use the um, resource in, um, provided on the screen. Okay. Well, that concludes today's NIO webinar. And again, thank you so much, Tina, and for those who have participated today. And have a great day, everybody. Thank you so much. Thank you. Bye-bye. Bye-bye.